Let's see if this computer's going to work. I'm 40% sure it will crash. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Hamza. So, yeah, welcome to day 14 of Data Science for Kaggle Decal. So today we're going to be talking about neural networks, which is probably one of the coolest machine learning algorithms out there. Um, so the agenda today will be, uh, we'll start off with a few demonstrations of just what neural networks can do to get you guys excited about um, learning about them. And then we'll talk about, first off, on a high level, what neural networks actually do. Um, and then we'll talk about their biological inspiration, um, the artificial neuron, and finally the feed-forward algorithm, which is how neural networks actually work under the hood. So to start... Um, or how they compute, not how they learn. Yeah. So oh, yeah, today we're only going to be talking about how they compute, um, or how they make decisions. Uh, tomorrow, Hums is going to be talking about uh, all the back propagation, which is the training algorithm that trains the neural networks, and the gradient de descent, and batch stochastic gradient descent, all that good stuff. Um, yeah, so for today, we're just going to talk about feed forward. Um, so again, um, neural networks have lots of really cool applications. For instance, actually, let's make this big again. First thing I'd want to show you guys is this thing called an autoencoder. And basically, it's not all that flashy, but it does something really cool. It takes an image, and it manages to reduce the dimensionality by a ton. So this is really good for image compression. For example, you can see here that um, given an image. So these, this is the original image. This is the image that was encoded by an autoencoder and then reconstructed using that same uh, neural network. And this is a resulting image. And this is PCA, which is called, which is principal component analysis. It's another compression algorithm, which is a bit more naive than uh, neural networks. And they have the same number of dimensions, the same size. And as you can see, autoencoders encode the image information really, really well. And so there's just three images here. Um, and these three links you can click on to learn more about the stuff. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah? When you say dimensionality reduction, do you mean like, hmm? um, remo like removing data? Or yeah, so images are so like, um, I don't know what dimension this is right now, but say it's like 32 by 32 pixels, then you have 32 squared dimensions of like information, right? You can adjust 32 squared different variables. Um, but a lot of that information is redundant, right? So when you store images, you want to store them uh, using the least space possible because, well, you want to conserve space or memory on your computer. So that's where dimensionality reduction comes in. It's also called image compression, by the way. So when you save images as like a JPEG format, that's also a type of dimensionality reduction or image compression, right? So autoencoders just make it really efficient. Um, let's see. Yeah, and the difference mm -hmm. is that JPEG, I mean, it's a compression format, but someone has to be really creative with the math, figure out, you know, oh, this compression format will allow me to optimally represent this image with this many bits. Yeah. Work out the math for that. But, like, a neural network is great for this because it learns the math of how to compress this. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. Yeah, so, um, we can go through how each of these algorithms work, um, after we learn about neural networks. For now, uh, just look at neural networks as a black box. Um, second example is something really cool. It's called style transfer. Um, and basically, it takes, like, you have an image, and then you have uh, called the content image, and then you have an image called the style image. For instance, the style image could be, like, Van Gogh's Starry Night. And it'll take the style of Van Gogh's Starry Night and apply it to uh, your content image. So I have a few examples of that that I want to show you guys. Um, can you guys see that? So, so okay. yeah. So here, you can see uh, the bear on the right was the original image, and the bear on the left is a style transferred image. And basically, that's a neural network doing all of that stuff. Um, and the style image of that picture is the Great Wave. Um, it's the Japanese one with a big wave. Um, yeah, and then you guys can, I was going to set up a bit.ly, but you guys can like friend me on Facebook and send me links to images, and then I'll style transfer 
them for you at the end of the lesson if you guys feel like it. Um, make sure the images are kind of small, like less than 800 by 800, because anything larger will take like a long time. Um, and then finally, um, I want to show you guys these things called the recurrent neural networks, or at least what they can do. Isn't there a link already mm -hmm. that someone has, like from MIT or some shit, that someone has set up where Actually, yeah. you give them the style you want to transfer in an image and they'll go to one of you or something like that? Mm -hmm. like, you yeah. can probably find that instantly with your videos. Like, yeah, you guys can try to find that. So here, um, recurrent neural networks are really good with um, data that's like, uh, that's kind of like time series. So like, uh, the next thing depends on the things before it. So for example, text is a really good example of this. So what you can do is crazy stuff like uh, give it all of Shakespeare's works and then train it on that and then generate Shakespeare. So um, this, this was completely made by the recurrent neural network. And um, as you can see, it looks kind of real, right? So um, if you read it, really closely, it doesn't make any sense at all. But the thing is, it can be real. Um, and Shakespeare's are kind of good uh, good for this because nobody really understands Shakespeare in the first place. Um, other things you can do is, let's see if I have it. Let's try words. So here's another, here's another recurrent neural network. I was trained on a dictionary, if I can find it. Actually, while you're waiting, um, here's here's a train of fake news. <laughs> it should be. It's it's not as good as a Shakespeare because fake you news you can actually news. understand. But yeah, oh, that's weird. Oh okay. Yeah. So this is a train of fake news. Obviously, it barely makes any sense. And at one point, it was outputting Russian or something ridiculous. <laughs> Let me see if I can find it. Is it really that ridiculous though? If it's in Russian. <laughs> There we go, here's some Russian for you guys. And a smiley face. So yeah, um, point is like, neural networks, we still don't really understand how they work. We just know that they work really, really well. Your term can render emotion. I have no idea, how, but apparently it does. And then here, they get the configured settings. here's a dictionary. Let's hope this works. No? Come on. There we go. That should work. So this is the recurrent neural network um, outputting like dictionary stuff. So you can see it's kind of like making its own words. Um, the words are in all caps. Uh, who has, yeah? Okay, so you said that we don't understand how neural networks work. Do you like actually need like the theory behind this? Yes. So, so okay, roll, you can take this. <laughs> so, if you want to get into like some high level, like not high level, but very advanced like learning theory shit with like compositional kernels and really funky like Hilbert space stuff and like Bernakis, Shapkis, whatever VC dimension um, <laughs> stuff. So recently we've actually been able to prove like theory for convolutional neural networks and vanilla feed forward neural networks that says like, yo, given this data distribution, you'll be able to learn it with this set of parameters, like these like activation functions or whatever. We still haven't gone to that point with recurrent neural networks. And either way, that math is very, very like abstract, very hard to understand and ground in reality. And that's only recent math. Before that, like since like, you know, these hidden layers in neural networks are doing such like high dimensional computation, we don't we as humans don't have like the capability to understand what the fuck is going on. So like what we have to do is like just rely on very qualitative analysis of what our neural network is learning by like, you know, pushing an image through the neural network, going to a certain hidden layer, getting the getting the uh, getting the activation out, mapping it to a two-dimensional space, and then visualizing what it looks like and trying to like happily understand what our neural network is learning by visualization. But also like a lot of information is lost when you go down to the 2D space. So it's like It's not that we don't know what it's doing. We know it has like, we know neural networks given enough parameters will basically act as a universal function approximator in that they can approximate any differentiable function. Um, but the problem is like, yeah, we don't, we, we understand that gradient descent happens and it gets closer to the real value. 
But like we don't while it's getting closer to the real value, we don't have like any way to like debug and say, Oh, this layer works better than the other one because of X reason specifically, this one feature works best with this like thing. Like there's no it's very it's very much like alchemy. And even though like some analysis has been done lately, like a lot of uh, deep learning theory has advanced to the point where now we can actually like prove some very nice theory for like feed forward and convolutional neural networks. It's still like a very like immature um, map. Like the tensor calculus isn't that well developed. Um, yeah, basically there's a lot that the industry still has to do um, before you can actually call like neural network science. I feel it's more like alchemy right now. We're getting there, but we're not there. <coughs> so. Yeah, no, so like this can contrast that to like linear regression where there is like a specific solution, like given a set of training data, there is like we know exactly what to do to get the best fit, and it's like pretty easy to do. But yeah, like Raul said, with like neural networks, it's a lot more like alchemy and like trying different things. And it's like a lot of like papers that you'll see in industry are like, oh hey, we tried a neural network, we made this adjustment to the neural network, it did better on this data set. Great. This but must be the answer. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's it's very empirical. It's not. It's not. There's not too much nice theory on it, and like another problem is like the people like doing a lot. Of, very few people like in the world can actually do like deep learning theory or do the math required for deep learning theory. Berkeley's fortunate that like we have some classes in that, and like we have a lot of professors that are pioneering that theory, and like we're in Silicon Valley, so we have access to resources of people in the industry that are pioneering the theory behind this field. But like, you know, it's still our data. Like most of the people that publish papers are not to the level where they can think of that math. They just know how to do the application and fuck around with this alchemy basically. And just keep trying till it works. Also in industry they have so much money that like they can train neural networks like instantly. So they can just try whatever the fuck they want and just like iterate over like so many combinations that it's like <laughs> it's like it's unfair to the rest of us. Yeah. Yep. And like two years ago, there were these things that came out called ResNet, which are like extremely deep like neural networks. And basically, deep learning was totally shot in the foot for like four months. Because it basically became a giant pissing contest between <laughs> like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, basically to see who could build the deepest residual neural network that did well on this task. So like, yeah. Any more questions? Cool. So. Uh... Yeah, first off, what does a neural network do? So like on a high level, uh, what's happening? So we're gonna, right now we're going to treat a neural network as a black box for now. And we're just going to talk about what the inputs should be and what the outputs should be. So as Ro Roel was saying, a neural network is actually a universal function approximator. So it'll, given enough parameters, it'll approximate any function that you want it to. Um, so real quick, um, a function... I think like in high school you, you learn that a function is something that takes in numbers and spits out numbers. But um, it's, it's kind of better to think of functions as more, something more general. Um, more, or you should think of them as something that maps elements of one set to elements of another set. So going down here, uh, one example in machine learning is uh, self-driving cars, right? And so what machine learning algorithms are doing in that situation is that they're taking the set of sensor inputs that a car gets. So that's like the space of all the images, all the sensors, all the whatever, uh, ultrasound, whatever, distance detectors. And they're mapping all of that input uh, to an output space or an output set of all the possible things a car can do. So for example, um, move, rotate the steering wheel like X number of degrees or turn on your blinkers or stuff like that. So in that sense, um, a function is really general. But going down here, um, in fact, all data is actually just numbers. And that's probably one of the most powerful things. Um, basically, uh, anything you can think of, you can basically encode it in numbers. Um, so really neural networks Technically, they do take in numbers and output numbers, but we associate meanings with those numbers, right? So when we give it um, um, a, a map or an, or an array of pixel values 
um, in a picture, then that's actually just numbers, but it really represents that image. And so you can think of neural networks as taking in some set of inputs and mapping them to some set of outputs. And yeah, everything in machine learning is just a uh, trying to find a function that uh, that does what you want it to do. So for example, a linear regression, you, for example, uh, house prices, you give it you give it like the square footage and you get a mapping from the square footage to the price. Uh, for example, in KNNs, you uh, say you run KNNs on MNIST like we did a week or a couple weeks ago. Um, what you're actually doing is you're giving it uh, some 28 by 28 pixel image and you're mapping that to one of 10 classes. So that's just another function. And so neural networks can be seen as a function approximator. You put in numbers on the top um, and it spits out numbers on the bottom. So it doesn't have to just be two numbers and one number output. It can actually have an arbitrary number of inputs or outputs. And that's one of the things that makes it really cool. Um, and so what these knobs uh, sig signify are the parameters of the network. So, oh yeah, by the way, picture credits to Shannon. Uh, she drew this for our blog, um, which is really nice. Uh, and it looks really good. So the, the knobs, what the knobs do, you can think of them as, uh, as you turn them around, they adjust the, uh, an, the output for a given input. So if you give like the machine some input, uh, it'll give you some output. And then as you slowly adjust the knobs, um, what you get out gradually changes, right? And so the whole goal of training a neural network is finding the correct parameters or adjusting the knobs in such a way that you get the what output you want from a given input, right? And so that's what Hums is going to talk about tomorrow. Um, everything about, or sorry, on Wednesday. Um, he's going to talk all about uh, the algorithms we use to try to figure out what parameters to use. So for day, today, I'm just going to talk about how the neural network uh, works on the inside and how the parameters dictate what the output is given an in input. And so um, these things are called neural networks, um, not for good, for good reason? For good reason, because they're, they're actually inspired by biological brains. So here's a video that some of you may have seen before. Crap, we have sound. Oh. Okay, well, I can, I can narrate this. <laughs> or, <laughs> wait, wait, um, just yeah? unmute it. Yeah. Unmute it? Ooh. Or, uh, I, I think we're plugged in. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure we're listening. Is the YouTube volume on? It's oh, pause it. Um, oh, it's fine. I can just narrate. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> basically, uh, what these researchers did was they took a cat, anesthetized it, and, well, I guess held its uh, head in place and showed it pictures of random things. And they wanted to get the cells or its neuron cells to fire, uh, particularly those in the visual cortex. And for a long time, they couldn't figure out how to get any of the cells to fire. No matter what they showed, nothing would go off until, um, or well, here's some struggling. Yeah, until they accidentally uh, got the cells to fire. And it turns out, it wasn't this shape at all. It was actually this this edge right here. So that going across the screen, uh, in the video you can hear like a tick, 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 tick sound. Uh, that's the neurons firing. And what they discovered is that the most basic cell in a uh, mammalian visual cortex is an edge detector. So basically, well, edge detectors detect edges and uh, help. Do you, do you have a call for that? Like, oh, jeez. What did I do? Uh, turn off voiceover. Turn off voiceover. <laughs> <laughs> should I refresh? Uh, no, no. Uh, ah, okay. There should be an option. Uh, option? No, no, no. Sorry. In, in the actual slide. Uh, page. Oh, okay. Uh, there's like a little button that says like, turn off voiceover. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you have simple edge detector cells right here, and they they get input at the edges, and they output to higher level cells, more complex cells like these. And eventually, you can stack up these edge de detecting cells um, uh, to detect really complex things. So this level will detect like simple edges. Then this will like maybe detect this line right here. This will detect a right angle. And then finally, this cell at the very top that gets the feedback from all of the cells below it can detect maybe a square or something. And so these these are just different types of edge detectors. There's a bar detector. There's a and then there's an edge detector, and you get the inverses of them, stuff like that. And one thing that these researchers found out is that um, they could actually find an A detector. So you have three cells right here that detect edges this way, this way, and this way. And as you can see, they make an A. And then these three cells input to this cell. And this cell will actually fire when you show an A to a cat. Right? And so that's where the biological inspiration comes from. Neurons take in inputs. And uh, under certain circumstances, they'll fire. So now what mathematicians did was they used this idea to create an artificial neuron, right? So also like mm -hmm. these neurons, they're firing on like visual stuff. Uh, but your your data format doesn't necessarily have to be like an image. So like after Wednesday's lecture or at the end of the semester, bug me about like artificial general intelligence and like some funky stuff about learning theory. Just remind me to talk about it. But basically like. In theory, it doesn't have to work on these structured things only. Like, it doesn't have to work on like an image where you know, like, you know that oh, the pixel values are arranged in this order or something. Like, literally, in theory, a neural network can take in the binary string representation of an image and learn these edge detectors. Not learn these edge detectors, but in its own way, figure out like how this binary translates to edge detectors or something, and then how that translates to like a final classification, a final decision, or something. But yeah, uh, they don't only work on images. They, in theory, like he said, work on any like setup of numbers. So yeah, so bug me later in the course uh, to talk about like artificial general intelligence and like learning theory and stuff. Yeah. Yep. So like Ro was saying, it like a neuron works on any numbers or no numerical inputs. So what happens in an artificial neuron is that you give it some number of inputs and Again, it can be an arbitrary number of inputs. So right here, we only have two inputs, just to simplify things a bit. Again, picture credits to Shannon. Um, so input one will be some number. Input two will be some number. And what the artificial neuron does um, is it multiplies each of the inputs by a weight. Uh, so that's happening right here. It'll add a bias and then apply an activation function to get the output. And um, if that wasn't clear, there's a more mathematical description right here. So what we have is that you have your inputs, x1 through xm, and we represent that as xi. And this, I mean, they're lazy, but this should be summing over the i's. I guess it's obvious. And then you have your weights, wi's, so w1 through wm. And you take the weighted sum of your inputs, basically. So x1 times w1 plus da-da-da-da, uh, so on, and then plus xm times wm. And then you apply some function f, right? And we'll get into what this function is all about. But for now, we'll just call it the activation function. And it'll be kind of mysterious until like five slides from now. And once you do all of this, you get the output y. Um, so are there any questions right now? Cool. So moving on, let's do a quick little toy example. Um, so if f of x, your activation function, is x squared, um, your x is uh, 1, 4, and negative 2, and your weights, w's, are negative 2, 3, and 2, what would the output be? And real quick, so x's and w's are really often written in the form of matrices. So for example, here, um, you can actually write this out as x transpose w, where 
x is 1, 4, negative 2, and w is negative 2, 3, 2. And so this way you can take advantage of uh, the definition of matrix multiplication and do things really quickly. Um, actually, that's, that's what GPUs do really well. They do matrix multiplications and matrix operations super fast. And this way, you can take advantage of their power. Um, are there any questions about this? So you just do 1 times negative 2 plus 4 times 3 plus negative 2 times 2. And that's actually basically the answer. Does anybody want to do this example? Um, I'm going to call out people. <laughs> you want to do it, Joy? I have no idea. Uh, okay, well, let's yeah, go. I think it is. Is it 30? Well, let's go through it. Let's go through it one by one. So, what's the first step? One times negative two, right? Yeah. So, the weighted sum. Yeah. Negative two plus 12. And then minus four equals six. And then applying the activation function gets you six squared, which is 36. How do you even make an act? Oh, that's what we're about to get into. Oh, okay. There we go. Well, I mean, yeah. So again, picture credits to Shannon. Um, there are two. There are like, yeah. That's that's Shannon's question. What makes a good activation function, right? So the first thing we want is our activation function to be uh, differentiable, continuously differentiable. Well, actually, just differentiable is good enough. Um, but the point is, subdifferentiable. Sub Don't know what that means. What's that? Uh, like if you have an absolute value or something, like even though it's not differentiable at all points, like you can kind of make a piecewise mm -hmm. derivative yeah. for it. Yeah. Um, yes. So um, we'll be getting a bit more into why the function needs to be differentiable uh, on Wednesday's lecture. But for now, we should just take it as granted that the activations uh, or the best activation functions should be differentiable. And it kind of has to do with um, uh, how you train your neural networks. So going back to the image of the, the picture of the neural network as a function machine, when you turn the knobs, you want it. So when you turn the knobs or adjust the parameters, if you adjust the parameters uh, really uh, by a teeny bit, you want your output to change by a teeny bit. And so the problem with non-differentiable activation functions is that uh, you get gigantic jumps in the output uh, in like right here, whereas you get absolutely no change in the output right here. So this ant right here is like, oh, I don't know where I am because I can't tell because everything looks the same because everything's flat, right? And here you have the ant going, we, because it's got, it knows where it is based on the slope or based on how much the activation function changes. So uh, by doing this, we'll make it really easy to train a neural network. Can you go back to the previous mm -hmm. one? Next one? Yeah, so this activation function that you see here, I mean, look, it's very simple. It just mm -hmm. looks like a step. But does anyone know where this is from? Like, think about neurons when I learned sheets and crap, Ooh. maybe bio, and this? Know where this activation from? I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. does anybody know what's wrong? But like, this is how like a synapse fires, right? Oh. Like, you remember like, so I mean, they're creating these neurons to model the brain. So remember like, in AP Bio or whatever, you kind of just like, it, you basically, your neuron doesn't like transfer <clears throat> neurotransmitters, right? Unless you're like myelin sheet, whatever the fuck, like, <laughs> gets a certain threshold, right? And then it basically fires a one signal, like, you know, send this neurotransmitter out. So that's basically what that yeah, is. So is. each of these red lines is uh, a stimulation of a neuron. And right, so this is time, this is voltage, and this is a firing. And so when it gets simulated by some voltage uh, that's below the threshold, it just fails, right? It doesn't output anything. And so that's what these two humps are for. Um, when it goes above the threshold, though, um, stuff happens with ions in the axons of the neuron, and it, I guess it depolarizes, and it creates a really big potential, and then... It's changed major. Huh? It's changed majors. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, basically, the neuron fires when it gets a strong enough threshold potential, 
right? or it gets above the threshold potential, and all this stuff is other bio stuff. But the point is, um, it's a very clear cut line between when it fires and when it doesn't fire, and that's where this is. So um, what this is, so this is you can think of this as input potential, and this would be the threshold, and this would be either a fire or a no fire, right? Yeah, and I just realized it's kind of interesting that our brains use yeah, a step function. I mean, like, but, if, if we um, knew why our yeah. brains use that function, we basically have artificial neural networks. Yeah, we basically don't know anything about the brain. Yeah? yeah like, so, do we, so do you want the smooth curve? Or like the yeah, you, so, hmm? you, you want the smooth curve. Um, I was just pondering why our brains actually use a step function. Kind of sound... Yeah, so we'll get into this more on Wednesday, right? But so this activation function is fine for the forward pass, right? It gives you some nice binary output, we you know, type of forward pass. End, whatever. <laughs> in the forward direction, in the predictive direction, when you do the multiplication and then send it through this activation function, it gives you a nice one or zero, right? And gives you a nice decision, right? A binary decision on what to do. Um, and this is fine for just making the decision. But if you think about like how it learn, or we'll get into this next week. But if you think about how it learns, or like how we've been doing learning slash approximation in this class, we've been taking a gradient and basically getting like getting an optimal set of weights, right? But you can't take a gradient to one step function because it's either zero everywhere or it's a Dirac delta at some points, right? So that's why we were saying like yeah, we don't know why our brain shows this function because like mathematically it makes no sense that it would be able to learn shit like it should in theory just well, like wait, wait, not maybe it's stop. because like we well, don't we, use back propagation though we use like yeah okay well, like, this is that's kind of off topic it doesn't have the gradient greedy problem like the sigmoid does so yeah but either way like no, never mind sorry this is yeah just, we, we can talk about this right. after wednesday all yeah. right um yeah so actually any more questions anybody got any more questions um, while you guys are thinking of good questions to ask me, we Wait, can uh, talk about why we decide to use activation functions and hmm? not just like just to do a bunch of linear combination. Oh right, right, right. Sorry. Um, well, I can show you guys a few activation functions real quick. Um, yeah. So why why do we want to throw this random f in there? Why do we want to why the f do we want to throw the f in there? Um, why why not just like multiply the things together, take the weighted sum, and then just use that as our output? Well. The point is, um, if you do that, it's literally just, so you're just taking this weighted sum of this set of inputs, right? And that's essentially just a linear combination. And if you take linear combinations of linear combinations, you get another linear combination, right? And so you get a linear decision boundary, right? Or you get a linear prediction. And so that's nothing different from linear regression, which is something we already know how to do. Right? So when we add this f in here, it, um, sometimes people will call it adding a nonlinearity. And that's where like, all of the predictive power of neural networks comes from. Uh, the fact that the, the activation function is not a linear function. Um, so for example, uh, we have we some kernels when we talk about regression. Hmm? Did we talk about kernelization? I don't think so. Did we, we talk, talk about, about SPMs? No, we didn't talk about like mapping stuff to other interfaces. No. Oh, that would hurt. No, but um, so yeah, one one more thing about activation functions is that uh, as it goes towards negative infinity, it should tend towards like zero or like negative infinity, and when it goes to positive infinity, it should tend toward uh, one or positive infinity. So some really popular activation functions is ReLU right here, or the rectified linear unit. So it's 0 everywhere below 0, and it's just x after 0. It's great um, for images. Hmm? Tan h right here, so hyperbolic tangent is good. Logistic is uh, pretty popular. Tan h is also good with images. And yeah, and I think some people use soft plus. Yeah, right here. But yeah, and then you get some really funky ones that I'm not really sure what they do. But yeah, like sinusoidal. Wait, who the fuck is this? <laughs> I don't know, man. Yeah, but basically, uh, if you stick to like ReLU and Tan H, you should be good. Um, yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. Uh, well, like, 
uh, how do we know that these functions are good for images or whatever application? And how do we choose them? <laughs> and why is it 10 towards 0? Why is it 10 towards 1? Uh, yeah, you know, you know how we said like neural networks is kind of like alchemy? This is what we you just try all of them and see. Yeah, yeah. Functions. That's the problem. Yeah, exactly. That's that's why we don't. If we if we knew what was like the best for what application, then we'd be so much further ahead in our knowledge of neural networks. Yeah. Um, so it's not that we don't know. Like we, it's like we constructed this thing and it works somehow sometimes, but we don't know when and we don't know why. So well, it's kind of the problem. We do now, uh, based on some. But uh, it only works on convolutional neural networks and feed-forward neural networks. So it only works on stuff where we've already predefined the structure of the problem and know like you can either pass it through a convolutional neural network or a feed-forward neural network. For like artificial general intelligence, we want to be able to communicate with the network with some language. In our case, we're probably going to be communicating with the neural network via binary, and this requires you to have like a recurrent neural network or something. Um, in order to handle the time series nature of binary, like bit string or whatever, um, but the problem is we haven't proven this theory. This we haven't like proven this nice theory for recurrent neural networks. We've only proven it for convolutional neural networks and fully connected neural networks. So if someone is able to come up with a proof for um, how much you're able to learn given a set of parameters in a recurrent neural network setting, we'll have basically made a huge step towards solving. But that is currently one of the boundaries. Um, yeah. But otherwise, it's just try shit. Like, that's it. And there is some intuition, though, as to why value works well in images. If you think about it, I mean, an image can't have a bug below 0. It can't have a bug 255. So values, having multiple values lets you do this nice. Since it's, you know, if you're greater than 0, output a value. If you're less than 0, don't do anything. You can essentially, like, think of, like, what if you had two values, one at 0 and one at 255? It would allow you then to bound all your output between 0 and 255. That's also why a tan h is popular, because it lets you go between negative 1 and 1. So you set 0 equivalent to a pixel value of like 127.5, or whatever the fuck, 255 divided by 2. Yeah, 127.5. Yeah. Yeah, 127.5, and now tan h gives you a nice output on your pixels. So like. It is empirical and it does have some intuition as to why it would work. But largely, it's still out. If we were like transforming uh, an image into, say, a word, a concept, mm -hmm. the space, the spatial, whatchamacallit, the space is different dimensions. And like, I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of. Yeah, it's kind of it's it's but like, the ReLU is good for extracting. From images, since you have this zero to two fifty five bound. Okay. Yeah. On a side note, um, the reason, well, one of the reasons why we don't know so much about this is that like deep neural networks, deep learning is still a really new field. So if you guys want to do any research, do it in deep learning because you'll probably make uh, something. Or you should just do it because it's cool. Um, <laughs> but also, you might be able to make some really cool discoveries. Um, so, has anybody here heard of Human Centipede? Um, okay, so basically, it's a horror movie. And I think this will give you some really good insight into my current mental state right now. So, <laughs> actually, maybe we shouldn't use this analogy. If you guys want to... It's a good analogy. It's a good analogy, but it's kind of... creepy. Okay, so... We've already started. Okay, fine. I'll just finish it. Um... <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so basically, the plot of the movie, I haven't watched it. I've only read the Wikipedia thing. And apparently it's like a big meme on the internet. Um, but basically this crazy, mad uh, scientist or doctor uh, kidnaps a couple people. And he wants to create like a really long digestive tract. So what you do is you take the beginning of one person's digestive tract and sew it on to the end of another person's digestive tract. Does everyone and, know what human centipede is? Can we just yeah. take <laughs> <laughs> Okay, whatever. So the point is, um, this you is kind of human, like... You know how, what human centipede is? No. Okay, no. it's, it's fine. I'll, I'll explain, explain it without no, needing to know the analogy. Okay? Basically, look, but okay. it is a good analogy. Well, I'm going to speed up the analogy. <laughs> it's ask not, right? It basically, <laughs> lines up people, makes them like... Go like hands and knees, like 
crawling position, <laughs> lines them up ass to mouth, and sews people's asses to mouths. Okay, thanks, Raul. Absolutely. For that really descriptive imagery. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what's happening in a neural network. So what we have is we have one, one artificial neuron. It takes in like uh, some number of inputs, and it has one output. And it sends that output to another artificial neuron later down the chain. And that's like exactly what was happening uh, here with the cat neurons, right? So s simple artificial neurons uh, can combine and create ever more complex neurons that detect more and more complex things, right? And the body is an activation function. All right, all right, enough. <laughs> yeah, so I guess if you want to recall how neural networks work, you can think of human centipede now. Um, actually, it gets even crazier. Um, so this is just one. This is just one neuron to another neuron, right? So if you want to continue the analogy, some actually, I'll just shut up. <laughs> so, um, right. So, oh yeah. What happens is that the output from one neuro or from one artificial neuron becomes the input for another neuron, right? Um, so, like you can imagine, the inputs from here could have been from like other neurons. Um, so yeah, so now that we have that down, uh, we can talk about a neural network's architecture. So as of now, we've only been talking about artificial, neuro artificial neurons uh, singularly. Uh, now we want to combine the neurons into some kind of uh, architecture, right? And so how do we do that? Um, we, the, most, the most common way to do this is to put them in layers, right? So we have any arbitrary number of artificial neurons in layers like this, right? And the outputs of one of these neurons goes to every single neuron in the next layer. So this neuron, uh, it gets some input and it sends its output to uh, this neuron, using this arrow, this neuron, and then this neuron. And the, yeah, so there's also an input layer. So every architecture, every network has an input layer in the beginning. So these, you just feed in the numbers directly. And from here, it'll compute. It'll send its computations to hidden layers. Uh, and you can have multiple hidden layers. And then finally, the network has to end in an output layer where these neurons compute whatever it is they compute. Uh, apply an activation function, all that good stuff, and it outputs numbers. So essentially, this blue part is actually, oh, uh, can we get to it? These blue funnels in the machine, and this green output funnel is are these neurons, right? And so you can see how neural networks can have an arbitrary number of outputs and inputs. You can just put as many neurons as you want in the input layer or the output layer. And, I mean, obviously, yeah. so that makes sense for your task. Right, right. So, for example, for MNIST, what happens is that you want you want 784 or 28, 28 times 28, uh, yeah, 28 times 28 input neurons, and you want 10 output uh, neurons, one for each class of digits, right? Um, let's see. I think we talked about all this, and then uh, finally, side note. When each neuron from the previous layer is connected to every neuron in the next layer, um, it's called a fully connected scheme or fully connected neural network. So, yeah. Um, any questions about this? Do people know? Oh, yeah. Go. Yes, yeah, sir. Generally, um, neural networks are supervised algorithms. Yeah, they're supervised. Uh, they uh, can or, be unsupervised too. We actually. No. They're mostly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. They can also be. Well, really technically, supervised. that is supervised. Because, like, your input is also the label. Yes, it's supervised <laughs> in that you have a label, but it's unsupervised in that you didn't have to make a label. I guess. Aside from actually, that's kind of. Passing in the NumPy array. It's kind of, kind of undefined there. But, but yeah, there yeah. are unsupervised learning techniques for it. There's combinations of unsupervised and supervised in, like, active learning and recommendation systems. Then there's also, like, weekly supervised, which is, I'm just not going to get into that, but like, it's, it's basically like if you already knew something about your output distribution, you can add that data to your 
supervised algorithm or unsupervised algorithm to make it weekly supervised. Right, and we'll get more into that tomorrow, or sorry, on Wednesday when Hamza talks about that propagation gradient descent. Um, so this this makes sense to everybody. Yo, did you, know, you have a question? Yes. No. Oh. Uh, well, I think I was going to ask, like, are layers differentiated by like different activation functions, or do they just like do the oh, same yeah. functions? Yeah. Yeah. Good point. So as as the architect of your neural network, you can choose whatever the heck you want. Uh, so each of these layers can have a different activation. Um, and each of the layers, each of the hidden layers, it doesn't matter how big the hidden layers are. So that's, uh, have we talked about hyperparameters? Um, yeah, so. No, we're going to talk about those, that on Wednesday. Uh, so essentially today and Wednesday is just mainly introducing the algorithm uh, in the forward sense and also how to train the uh, neural network. The remaining parts of this course will essentially be on like how to actually architect these neural networks. So like, Hyperparameters is something we'll get to on Wednesday, but a lot of these questions about like, you know, how does this layer work better than or something better than this other layer in X case or whatever, we're gonna be getting into that over the next three weeks. So um, yeah, this week is mainly just to introduce the algorithm and like the implementation of it will actually come in the following weeks. Um, but before we wrap up, does everyone understand where the activations are? on this and what the input is, where the linear summations are happening. Yes? No? Yes, yeah, so, so real quick, we can go through that. Um, each of the, you can imagine each of these arrows having uh, a weight. So for example, for this neuron, it has two inputs. And it'll like, you can think of it as like when the, or this is how I like to think of it, when the output of this neuron travels along this arrow, it gets multiplied by some weight right here. And so, and then when it gets to this neuron, um, you take this output that's been weighted and this output that's been weighted, and you sum them together, and then you apply an activation function. So, and so each of the arrows is, tech, or you can think of each of the arrows as a weight. So actually, probably a better way to think about this is, let's say you have, sorry, Dan. Ouch. Let's say, sorry. Um, let's say you have some input layer, right? This gets transformed by some weight multiplication, W. Right. I just assume there's funky combinations and arrows like that. I'm only going to draw one arrow. Um, now we have our hidden layer. The hidden layer actually has two components. The hidden layer has an input portion that receives these summations, and then it sends those input portions to another part of the neuron that actually performs the activation. So you can... Oh, can you go back? Yeah. So you could... I don't know if you guys have taken 170 or 70 and talked about like dummy nodes and graphs. But essentially, you can actually think of each of these nodes in the hidden layer as having two components, or being actually two nodes. Like, so each one of these hidden layer nodes can actually be represented like this, right? Where this is basically the summation comes into this node, then you apply like um, you apply your activation here somewhere in this portion, and then it goes to this output node and then gets fed into the next layer. So like. This hidden layer, so basically all these hidden layers have two components. The only components that do not have, or the only layers that do not have two components are the input layer and the output layer. Where the input layer has just basically this second portion, right? And it, but yeah, it basically has this second portion where it just, you know, outputs it and some linear sum happens. And the output layer only has like, only just has this input portion, and that's it. Yeah, and if you look at like library, like oh, actually, sorry, one more thing. Actually, the output layer can can have two neurons. Sometimes people like represent an activation function on the output layer itself. Um, yeah, like typically, like I would just perform, like, say my calculation, my weighted sum, then throw an activation function after the hidden layer, and then just feed that out into the output layer. But some people in their depiction of neural networks uh, assume that like there's a last activation on the output layer. Depends on the author. Yeah, so yeah. if you look at like libraries like TensorFlow or any of the, or many other popular libraries, you'll see that they think of the activation separately from the matrix multiplication thing that Raul was talking about. And when I talk about backprop, I'll follow that. Yeah, the TensorFlow kind of follows this logic where do your multiplication, that's one operation, 
Now you do your function. That's another operation, that linear arrow. Now you perform whatever other math op you want on it afterwards. Yep. So we can do a quick feed forward example. This is actually taken right from the boot camp slides, so some of you guys might get a bit bored. But um so yeah, basically what's the output of five? Right? Um yeah, I'll give, I'll give you guys like a minute to think about it. Or does anybody have any questions? It's just a bunch of matrix, matrix multiplications. Yeah. Well, yeah, you can think of it that way. It's uh, 741. Yeah. <laughs> mm, does anybody think they have an answer? Isn't the answer there? No. Is it? You scared me. No, 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 yeah. So this is, yeah. Or are those the answers for back prop? Oh, no, no, I... It's just all the setup. Cool. Does uh, somebody want to come up here and do it? Or do you want me to do it for you guys? I can do it. Hamza, do you want to do it? Sure. Alright, Hamza's going to do it for us. Alright, so... Okay, so basically what you do is... So first let's consider three input. So for that what we're doing is we're doing... W13 times x1 plus W23 times x2, which is uh, two, two times one plus negative three times zero. Is equal to two, and then similarly, W one four times X one plus W two four times X two. That maps this to one times one plus uh, four times zero is one. And now what we need to do is we apply our activation function, this guy. So f of two equals one. And then f of one equals one. So now what we do is we do We do W three five times three out plus W four five times four out is equal to two times one plus negative one times one is equal to one. And then 
we apply our activation function again. Five out equals to left of one equals one. Everyone got that? Anyone have any questions? So, yeah, um, the answer is right here. So if you guys just like press the right arrow a couple times, you wouldn't gotten the answer. But um, so as you guys can see, um, yeah, so the answer is one. Um, as you guys can see, feed forward is kind of boring and tedious, and that's why we get computers to do it for us. Um, so yeah, that that's pretty much the presentation or the lesson. Does anybody have any questions about what just happened or any questions about anything about life? Questions, comments, threats. <laughs> um, and yeah, Sam. Hmm? Oh, are there permissions? Yeah, it's like usually if you share the slides. Rip. Oh, just go, just go to share and then like let anybody with the computer. Uh, oh, whoops. Cool. Can yeah, edit? Yeah. No, wait. Can use it. Public on the web. Okay, sure. anyone with the computer. Make sure they can only view it. Can you guys view it? Shoot, is it on the website? Actually, wait. How, how'd you get to it? Um, yeah, I put it on the GitHub. Okay, yeah, sweet. Wait, do we even update that website anymore? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Daniel, occasionally. Daniel, occasionally. <laughs> Actually, it's been a week since I've done it, but I've been oh. on break for wait, a week. <laughs> so I can't remember. <laughs> um, all right. You guys can either go or we can go through uh, TensorFlow. Because um, we don't actually have a quiz today. But. Um, yeah, do you guys all know what TensorFlow is? Real quick. Anybody who doesn't know what TensorFlow is? All right, sweet. Uh, all right, and you too. Um, so basically, TensorFlow is um, this library from Google that makes creating neural networks super easy. Uh, and and uh, I have um, code for TensorFlow that creates a neural network that trains on MNIST, if you guys want to see it. Um, or you guys can go. Uh, either either is fine. Uh, we'll put the code on GitHub anyways. But um, yeah. Hmm? It's pretty fast, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I could run it really quickly. Its output is super boring, though. Um, is, it, is it just classifying? The, uh, yeah, it's just classifying. It doesn't even like. Here, let me let me see if I can get it. No. Thanks for making that fellow card complete. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah. They're only two months old. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see if we can do this. Start a new meeting. Hi, guys. Actually, this is, this is probably not worth the wait. Uh, well, we can show it in either next time or the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we could. Can, yeah, we can just show it's, it next time when I'm like going to be recording. When we don't have to do this hacky Google Hangouts. Yeah, there. yeah, we can show it next time. Um, literally, you guys want to see the output? Uh, you guys can come up here and see the output if you want. Um, literally, it's just a long list of numbers, and then it finally says, 